This is the VOA Special English Development Report. More than three billion people are at risk from indoor air pollution because of the heating or cooking fuels they use. Most live in Africa, India, and China. They use biomass fuels like wood, crop waste, animal waste, or coal. These solid fuels may be the least costly fuels available, but they are also a major cause of health problems and death. For more than 30 years, the Aprovecho Research Center has been designing cleaner, low-cost cooking stoves for the developing world. Dean Still is the director of the group, which is based in the United States. He notes a World Health Organization estimate that more than one and a half million people a year die from breathing smoke from solid fuels. Mr. Still says, and half of the people on planet Earth every day use wood or biomass for cooking. These are the people on Earth who have less money, and the richer people use oil and gas. It's been estimated that wood is running out more quickly than oil and gas, and so it is very important for the poorer people to have very efficient stoves that protect their forests and that protect their health. Every year, Aprovecho holds a stove camp at its testing station in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Engineers, inventors, students, and others come together to design and test different methods and materials for improving stoves. Over the years, the group has made stoves using mud, bricks, sheet metal, clay, ceramics, and old oil drums. Most of the stoves look like large, deep cooking pots. They have an opening at the bottom for the fire and a place on top to put a pot. Through the years, Dean Still says his group has experimented with countless stove designs. He says the goal is to make a very inexpensive stove that costs about $5. It would make very little smoke, so it would be safe for health and reduce global warming and deforestation. Aprovecho has now partnered with a stove manufacturer in China. The company is making Aprovecho's first mass-produced stoves. They are said to use 40 to 50 percent less wood than an open fire and produce 50 to 75 percent less smoke. A company called Stove Tech is selling them through its website for less than ten dollars. Dean Still says that more than 100,000 have been sold so far. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Charter schools operate with public money, but without many of the rules that govern traditional public schools. In the United States, the rules for charter schools differ from state to state. But in general, these schools have greater freedom to decide what to teach and how to teach it. A charter school might be independent or connected to the local public school system. It might be started by teachers, parents, community groups, or in some cases, a profit-making business. The charter is a performance contract. It establishes the goals of the school 
and other details like how student performance will be measured. 47 million students attend traditional public schools, but more than a million students attend charter schools. And now a group of charter schools have formed the Green Charter Schools Network. The idea is to have environmentally friendly school buildings, but to also go further than that. The schools teach students to become involved in community issues that affect them and the environment. For example, young children grow crops in a school garden and learn about healthy eating. Older students help recycle waste from the cafeteria. And local schools share what they grow in community gardens with people in need. Jim McGrath is president of the Green Charter Schools Network. He says there are about 200 green charter schools across the United States. He says the plan is to also include traditional public schools as well as private schools. He says every action we make has an effect on the earth and we all need to be change agents so that we do not destruct our natural resources for future generations. The Green Charter Schools Network holds its first national conference this October in Minnesota. It will include companies and organizations like Waste Management and the United States Green Building Council. Supporters of green schools say their goal is to expand the movement across the country. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. Is your school doing anything special to go green? You can tell the world by posting a comment at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also read and listen to all of our reports and watch captioned videos. Plus, we now offer a verb phrase of the day by SMS. The service is free, but standard message rates may apply. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. China says it has passed Germany and become the world's top exporter. Exports totaled more than one trillion dollars last year. That was down from 2008, but about 30 billion more than Germany. China's influence in the world has increased with its fast-growing economy. The United States remains the largest economy. China is third and gaining on Japan. Manufacturing has expanded, fueling exports. But China has not imported as much as its trade partners would like. Its policies about valuing its currency and its human rights record have also created tensions. And now there is a new dispute. China is the world's largest internet market, but Google says it may leave. The company said it was targeted by a major internet attack launched from China in December. It says intellectual property was stolen and the attackers sought access to Gmail accounts of Chinese human rights activists. At least 20 other large companies in different industries were also targeted. Also, the company said it is no longer willing to censor search results as required by Chinese law. Google says it is still observing censorship laws,
but it will hold talks with the government in the coming weeks. Google.cn launched four years ago. Google is estimated to have around a 30% share of the search market in China. But that is only about half the share of the Chinese search engine Baidu. Baidu also reported an attack on its website in January. Online advertising sales in China are estimated to bring Google only a few hundred million dollars a year. Not much for such a big company, notes business expert Faribor Skadar at Penn State University. He says Google has to make a decision. It can stay in China or it can move out so as to protect its name and brand because of the restrictions and cyber attacks. Online activity in China is closely watched and the government tries to limit access to many sites including VOA. In January, a foreign ministry spokeswoman said China's internet is open and that Chinese law bars cyber attacks. Another government official said China itself is the victim of a growing number of foreign attacks. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said she would like an explanation from the Chinese about Google's accusations. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. You can find more reports about economics at voaspecialenglish.com. I'm Carolyn Prasuti with the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Food prices continue to rise, threatening to push more people into poverty and hunger. Experts have been urging increased efforts around the world to increase agricultural productivity. A new report by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says one of the best ways would be to remove the barriers women farmers face that male farmers do not. Women farmers are often less productive than men. But there are good reasons for that, says Agnes Kuisenbing. She is an economist with the International Food Policy Research Institute. She says women farmers have fewer resources than male farmers. The new FAO report says women make up 43% of the world's farmers, but only about 10 to 20% of them own the land they farm. Without owning land, it is harder for them to get credit to buy inputs such as better seeds and fertilizers. In many countries, women are half as likely as men to use fertilizers to increase the amount of crops. In addition, Ms. Quisenbing says many of the world's women are raising their children at the same time they are farming. The FAO report says helping women farmers could increase agricultural output in the developing world by as much as 4%. This in turn could reduce the number of undernourished people by as much as 17%. Ms. Quisenbing says just helping women farmers have the same resources that male farmers have would do a lot to improve agricultural productivity and reduce hunger and malnutrition. Ms. Quisenbing helped write the FAO report. She says the report does not try to gain sympathy. It makes the case for women farmers based on business reasons. She says governments should support programs 
that help women farmers. These include financial support to help them buy better seeds and fertilizers. But she says policies in many countries also need to change. She says many laws discriminate against women in the areas of property, labor force, and marriage. Ms. Quisenbing says studies show that women are more likely than men to spend money on food, health, and educating their children. And that means a better future for the next generation. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. You can find transcripts and MP3s of our reports at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Snakes bite an estimated five and a half million people worldwide each year. Experts say tens of thousands of people die from venom poisoning. An untreated or incorrectly treated bite might require the removal of a foot or an arm. Each year, around 400,000 amputations are the result of snake bites. Last year, for the first time, the World Health Organization added snake bites to its list of neglected tropical diseases. This recognition aims to bring greater attention to the problem. Scientists know of about 3,000 kinds of snakes. About 600 of them are poisonous. These are most often found in rural areas in tropical climates. Asia and Africa have the highest number of snake bites, together about four million a year. Latin America and islands in the South Pacific follow. The highest number of victims are agricultural workers. Snake bites are also common among fishermen, hunters, and children. Many victims live in areas with poor or non-existent health care systems and where anti-venom treatments are often not available. Anti-venom is the only cure, but experts say anti-venom technologies and their use need to be improved. Problems include a shortage of manufacturers and the high cost of treatment. Also, there is a widespread lack of knowledge among local health workers about how to use antivenoms. The treatments can cause dangerous and even deadly reactions if not used carefully. Antivenom contains proteins from animals such as horses or sheep. The animals are injected repeatedly with one or more different snake venoms to produce immunity. The Lancet Medical Journal recently published a series of reports on snake bite prevention and treatment. David Worrell at the University of Oxford in England co-wrote one of them. He praised efforts by the WHO to establish common practices for the production, regulation, and control of anti-venom. But he says more must be done. The authors say community education programs could help prevent snake bites by teaching people how to avoid them. They also suggest actions like providing protective boots to wear while working in fields and not sleeping on the ground. Also important is providing information about where dangerous snakes are most likely to live and when they are most active. 
And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Health Report. Freezing weather can mean frostbite and hypothermia unless a person is prepared. Today, we talk about how to stay warm, dry, and safe. Frostbite is damage that happens when skin is exposed to extreme cold for too long. It mainly happens on the hands, feet, nose, and ears. People with minor cases of frostbite that affect only the skin may not suffer any permanent damage. But if deeper tissue is affected, a person is likely to feel pain every time the area gets cold. If blood vessels are damaged, people can suffer a gangrene infection. Sometimes the only way doctors can treat an injury like this is to remove frostbitten areas like fingers and toes. Hypothermia is a condition that develops when the body cannot produce as much heat as it releases. Signs of hypothermia include uncontrollable shaking, very slow breathing, and difficulty thinking clearly. Hypothermia can lead to death if the person does not receive help. To avoid cold-related injuries, here is a simple way to remember four basic steps to staying warm. Think of cold, C-O-L-D. The C stands for cover. Wear a hat and scarf to keep heat from escaping through the head, neck, and ears. And wear mittens instead of gloves. In gloves, the fingers are separated, so the hands might not stay as warm as they would in mittens. The O stands for overexertion. Avoid activities that will make you sweaty. Wet clothes and cold weather are a dangerous combination. L is for layers. Wearing loose, lightweight clothes, one layer on top of another, is better than wearing a single heavy layer of clothing. Make sure outerwear is made of material that is water resistant and tightly knit. D is for dry. In other words, stay as dry as possible. Pay attention to the places where snow can enter clothing. These include the tops of boots, the necks of coats, and the wrist areas of mittens or gloves. And here are two other things to keep in mind, one for children and the other for adults. Eating snow might be fun, but it lowers the body's temperature. And drinking alcohol might make a person feel warm. But what it really does is weaken the body's ability to hold heat. Next week, advice from experts about what to do and not to do to help someone who is injured by cold weather. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Web browsers first appeared on computers in the early 1990s. Since then, the Internet has greatly changed the way people communicate. But some teachers think the changes are not all for the better. Eleanor Johnson is an English professor at Columbia University in New York City. Professor Johnson says she thinks text messaging has made students believe that it is acceptable to make bad spelling and grammatical errors. She says her students have increasingly used 
less formal English in their writing. She says words and phrases like guy and you know now appear in research papers. And now she has to talk about another problem in class, incorrect word use. For example, a student uses preclude instead of proceed when talking about one event coming before another. Preclude sounds like proceed, but it means prevent. Professor Johnson suspects a strong link between the rise of instant and casual communication online and an increase in writing mistakes. But she admits there may not be much scientific evidence, at least not yet. David Crystal is a British linguist who has written more than 100 books, including the book Language and the Internet. He says the actively changing nature of the Internet makes it difficult to stay current in studying its effects. But he believes its influence on language is small. He says the main effect of the Internet on language has been to increase the expressive richness of language. Erin Jansen is founder of NetLingo, an online dictionary of Internet and text messaging terms. She says the new technology has not changed existing language, but has greatly added to the vocabulary. Basically, it's a freedom of expression, she says. And what about teachers who find these new kinds of mistakes in spelling and grammar in their students' work? What is her message to them? Ms. Jansen says she tells them not to get angry or upset, but to get creative. Teachers and educators want to get children to communicate. But Erin Jansen and David Crystal agree with Eleanor Johnson on at least one thing. Teachers need to make sure students understand the rules of language. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. We want to know what you have to say about the effects of the Internet on language and writing. Post your comments at voaspecialenglish.com.